I don't want to confuse you, so I'm going to give you a little heads up that I'm going to be talking for a bit before getting into our text for today. Most recognize this Sunday before Easter as Palm Sunday, the Sunday where we mark Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. But as I reflect back on my preaching over the years, more often than not, I have preached on this account of Jesus' entrance in Jerusalem. And hopefully there have been some thought-provoking angles on that as I've reflected on the cheers that have turned into jeers. Next Sunday, of course, it seems like something of a no-brainer that we'll be preaching on the resurrection of Jesus. The problem with this pattern is that there is an awful lot of very rich scriptural material that falls in between those two topics that a preacher can easily overlook if one is rigid in that regard. You know, this would be maybe less of an issue for me if I had other opportunities to preach during the week. At least I'm comforted to know that many of you will be attending our Monday Thursday service this week that will reflect deeply on scripture. But apparently Protestants who work together 40 years ago in developing what we refer to as uh, the common lectionary recognized this problem as well. And that's why on this Sunday, they have developed uh, two tracks, if you will, to choose from. One focus is referred to as the Liturgy of the Palms, and the other is referred to as the Liturgy of the Passion. We realize that we celebrate Christ's entrance into Jerusalem, knowing full well what will happen by week's end. So then some churches refer to today as Palm Sunday, and others refer to this as Passion Sunday, depending upon their scriptural focus for that year. So that's, that's a somewhat long-winded introduction to explain why I'm not preaching on Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem this year. The full alternate reading, Luke 22, 14, all the way up through the end of the following chapter is exceedingly long and includes the account of the Last Supper, Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives, the, the arrest of Jesus, Peter disowning Jesus, the guards mocking Jesus, Jesus before Pilate and Herod, the crucifixion and Jesus' death and burial. Talk about a lot of material to choose from. So I might be referring to some of those stories, but this morning I'm going to be narrowing our focus quite a bit by just reading Luke 22, 39 through 54, Jesus praying at the Mount of Olives, followed by his arrest. So, listen to God's word to you today. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly, and the sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? 
When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, the, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come with them, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour, the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of, of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight this day, our Lord, our God, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it really is tempting to remain upbeat, to stay positive. It's appealing to go from the shouts of Hosanna one week to the joyous shouts of he is risen the next week. And while it's understandable to want to stay positive, we miss a great invitation in so doing. We, I like to think we miss the call to face the darkness. This past Monday morning, I was on the phone with my sister, and she was sitting on the balcony of her retirement community across the street from Covenant School, a ministry of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And as we spoke, she started screaming that police cars were racing by and heading up the hill to the campus. And just then she got an active shooter alert on her cell phone. You see, on most Tuesdays, this was Monday, but on most Tuesdays she volunteers to spend time covering the welcome desk at that school. She later saw a picture of the shooter on TV and could see from the screenshot that he was just about 10 feet away from the desk where she might have been sitting. She knew the head of school who was killed, and she knew that one of the girls who was killed was the daughter of her beloved pastor. And she was entirely shaken and heartbroken. You see, it's bad enough to wring our hands over Ukrainian villages that have been wiped off the map, but sometimes that darkness finds us in what we presume to be safe, upper-middle-class enclaves, where seemingly everyone is good and does the right thing. Do not be deceived, though. We must learn to face the darkness in the world. I thought of that this week as I reflected on this reading on Jesus with his disciples at the Mount of Olives. Jesus was facing the end. And like a terminally ill patient, he knew that death was just around the corner. I mean, perhaps I should clarify. He knew not only that death was just around the corner, but he knew suffering was just around the corner as well. I think that many of us don't bring our full imagination to bear in this regard. Not only do we gravitate towards the happy ending of the Easter story, but many are invested in a debatable theology when we sum things up with Jesus agreeing to basically a straightforward transaction to placate a wrathful or temperamental father. We could easily take a whole adult education class to explain this theory. But when we focus 
simply on the simple concept of paying off a debt, we aren't struck as much by the horrors of the cross. Jesus knew about the horrors of Roman crucifixion, execution. And so his prayers in the garden were both passionate and and visceral. He went to this place where he was accustomed to going in order to pray, to, to grapple with all that is going on and to cry out to God. And yet when he needed time alone, he also needed the support of his disciples. So he asked that they support him in prayer just a stone's throw away. And we know how the story goes. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of their grief. They would understand our exasperation with stories both from Nashville and Ukraine. They are exhausting. We just want to sleep rather than truly face the suffering in the world. But Jesus faced the darkness. And so we can identify with his humanity when he floats this idea before God, is there any way that this cup could be removed from me? I'm sure you've heard the Christian truism, God will never give you more than you could handle. And with, while this sounds like a thought of good cheer on the surface, it, in a sense it cuts in a way that is not anticipated. If you were the one bearing an unbelievable burden, if you were the one who just tragically lost your nine-year-old daughter and someone gives you such a Christian pep talk, it's easy to conclude, therefore, that there must be something wrong with you. In this moment of time, you really can't handle it. And you don't want to be told that you're not a good enough Christian in admitting this. Do do you see how this well-meaning thought can actually put an additional burden on someone, a kind of a, a toxic positivity? Alas, there seems to be a tendency to avoid facing the darkness, and so we put a positive thinking spin on things. And I wonder if we're not finding an example of that actually right in our text today. Jesus prayed, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. But I find it interesting that scholars believe the following verse was actually added at a later date. Verse 43 reads, Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. That doesn't really sound like a bad thought, but I wonder if it's reflective of our tendency to want to make things seem easier than they really are sometimes. Let's not avoid the darkness. Let me tell you my take on this. I believe that part of the good news of the cross is that when we face our own darkness and go through real suffering in the world, we have a Lord who can fully identify with whatever we are going through. Rather than a message of, oh, it's really not that bad, our message is that Jesus can fully identify with us in our darkest hour. There is no suffering that we can go through in life where we cannot find Jesus fully identifying with us. Jesus is not trying to hurry us along to the happy ending. Jesus is not judging us, but is being fully present with us in our darkest hour. And for God's sake, he is not falling asleep on us. Can we jump ahead to that scene on the cross when Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is taking 
our experience of suffering to the farthest extent when experientially we don't even sense God's presence with us at all. Perhaps that's the greatest suffering of all. Yet God is still with us. As a psalmist says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. It's a matter of perspective. What might seem as utter darkness to us is not dark to God. God is with us. In the Christian classic, St. John of the Cross refers to the dark night of the soul. La noche oscura del alma. He describes this painful reality of feeling totally devoid of any sense of God's presence. And what a terrifying experience that is. You've lost that sense of certainty of, of who you are in, in relation to God. The skilled spiritual director will not try to rush you through this phase with positive affirmations. The gift of the dark night is that when letting go of all former certitudes, you are unknowingly opening the door to deeper realities and to a more immediate, authentic sense of God's presence. When you face the darkness, you move beyond the God of easy answers to the God of authentic experience. That sense of being alone in the dark is preparing your soul, cultivating your soul for something more. Back to our story. After praying for God's presence in the face of imminent suffering, a crowd formed. Judas betrayed him and he was led away to the high priest's house saying, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. He came into the world, loving the world steadfastly, even though this unavoidably led to facing the power of darkness. Jesus loved the world to death. Jesus loved the world to death and did not waver from the path that this put him on. This is the pattern. When you love, you become like a grain of wheat that breaks open and dies and brings forth new life. As Jesus reminds us elsewhere, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, speaks of Jesus' sacrifice, but points out that Jesus' death was not a ritual sacrifice. It didn't happen in a temple, but on an execution site. He writes, Jesus' sacrifice is the sacrifice of obedience. At every moment in his life, he has given his heart to God in such a way that God is able to work through him with no interruption, with no diversion. At every moment, at every moment, Jesus fulfilled the law, not by obeying God like a reluctant soldier with a sergeant major ordering him around, but at every moment, Jesus has done what God wants. Even before his crucifixion, we could say that in Jewish terms that he was offering sacrifice, giving his heart to God in such a way that God is pleased with the gift. Jesus faced the darkness by living a life of obedience in radical love. By living a life of obedience in radical love. His sacrifice was bigger than a transactional moment on the cross. 
and beyond forever celebrating any particular moment, we are called to pick up our cross and follow him. We too are called to a path of unwavering love as we face the darkness. We're called to be caught up in this same love that allows us to face the darkness without falling asleep. Paul reminds us what it means to have the mind of Christ. Make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. On this path, we will not only come to the cross, but as we'll discover next week, we will discover resurrection life as well. Amen.